we just immediately locking down, as the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has suggested, in order to suppress the rising infections, the rising hospitalisations, we get the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine produced in its millions, we get people vaccinated, and then we can start getting back to normal. Well, clearly, that is the, the great challenge of... Uh, of the next couple of um, months is that we've got to control the virus whilst we get this vaccine rolled out. I mean, that has been the strategy all along, control the virus until a vaccine can make us safe. And it is great news today. It's great news that the, the vaccine has already now been injected into, into people's arms, starting in Oxford itself, which I think is appropriate. Uh, and I'm just so proud that this British success is there. Yeah, it's, it's good news, good news yeah. Health Secretary, but let's, let's be completely realistic. We interviewed an ICU nurse earlier at a busy London hospital. He said it's the worst he's known in 38 years. It is total chaos in many hospitals right now. The graphs are horrifying mm -hmm. in terms of the rate of transmission, in terms of hospitalizations, and we know, sadly, inevitably, that deaths will follow. You say the challenge is to control the virus. You've lost control of this variant, haven't you? Well, the new variant is much, much harder, right? Because it transmits so much easier from one person to another, and basically because you need to come into contact only with a very tiny amount of it to catch the disease. So we so have a situation harder. in London, Health Secretary, where we are in Tier 4, which people say is the equivalent of a sort of lockdown, but the latest figures show that we have more than 900 infections per 100,000 people. I mean, Tier 4 is not suppressing this virus. So I say again, the opening question, why are you not locking down? It's unfortunate, but the way that we know that we can suppress this virus is to go into the same sort of lockdown with the same sort of enforcement as you did on March the 23rd. Well, of course, you know, we had those measures calibrated against the old variant, which doesn't spread as much as this new one. And there are parts of the country where this is rising uh, the fastest uh, that are in Tier 3, and clearly, you know, we are prepared to take the sort of action, including the sort of action that you just described, Susanna, if that is what's necessary. Why are you necessary. waiting? I'm sorry, but this reminds me, I'm afraid, of what happened in March, when we waited and waited and waited until it was too late. And surely, given the rate of transmission here now, you're the health secretary, you've got, you're looking at the same graphs that I am. You must share my horror about what is happening. Surely we know that the only truly effective blunt instrument at this stage is to do a national lockdown, isn't it? I mean, I don't see any other way that you're going to get a lid on this, this variant. Well, the, it's about not only the measures that we put in place, Piers, but it's also about how everybody responds to them. And on Good Morning Britain, you have been uh, uh, unbelievably responsible throughout this crisis in explaining to people how important it is, because it's on all of us, right? The, ultimately, the reason that this virus gets from one person to another is when you come into close physical proximity. Uh, and that's why just staying apart and staying at home, unless you have a very good reason not to, they are so important. But in a way, you see, but for in a way, in a way, look. I think if we start from a position, none of us want a national mm. lockdown, right? None of us want a lockdown at all. It's an it's a horrible intrusion of all our liberties. I get that. However, uh, when you look at the reality of of how we can control this, at least with a national lockdown, there is clarity. You know, I felt that back in March, April. Everyone was in the same boat, albeit in different degrees of comfort, but everyone was in the same boat in terms of the, the rules applied exactly the same to everyone in the country. And there was a concerted effort, it felt, as a result of the clarity. My problem with this tier system is just anecdotally, nobody really understands what the different rules are in different tiers. Nobody understands how from one day to another in different streets, different roads, different rules apply. And that encourages a, people disregarding the rules. We saw it with a lot of footballers over the New Year period and so on. And Pep Guardiola, the Man City manager, almost offended them, saying, well, lots of people are doing this. I'm sure he was right. Uh, a national lockdown, horrible though it is on the economy and horrible though it is on the management of other public health issues, 
it is the blunt instrument that works most effectively. And right now, it seems to me, we are in a national emergency that could well be eclipsing anything we saw back in the first wave. Well, we are prepared to take the action that's necessary and sometimes very rapidly. You know, when we found out that this new variant spread so much faster, we moved within just over 24 hours to bring in the tier four. And we look at these data all the time. You know, the chart that you've just put on the screen, uh, as you say, is exactly, you know, we publish all the data, right? That is exactly the data that we look at. We also look at the how much of the new spread is the new variant because we know that it's so much easier to pass on. So we do look at this data but health uh, daily. Secretary, what you seem to be suggesting is that the tougher measures will be tier three moving into tier four. But I go back to the figures. In tier four, we're in London, that's where we are, Unfortunately, we still have a huge rate of infection. Tier four is not suppressing the virus. So the point that we keep making is surely a lockdown is something you inevitably have to bring in. Why aren't you doing it quickly? Well, we are prepared to move quickly. That's my answer. And we are prepared uh, to take whatever action is necessary and we, I think we've demonstrated that and, and including, you know, we often get criticised for, uh, for moving too fast. People say, oh, there's no certainty. But unfortunately, dealing with a virus like this, sometimes you do have so to move very fast So why are you bringing in a, national, a new national lockdown? We look at the data all of the time, Susanna, and we will take the action that is needed based on public health advice. But you don't think that's necessary today? Well, at the, at the moment, the fastest ra rises are in the tier three areas. And, you know, we've shown that we, if we need to move tier three into tier four, then we will. Actually, so I just want to pick you up on one point. That does suggest that tier you... three areas can expect to go to tier four imminently. If I can pick you up on one of the other points that you uh, made, which is so important, which is about the compliance and the degree of compliance, you know, there is a very um, serious problem in that people need to comply. But there is also very good evidence that the vast majority of people do comply. The challenge is that it's just so much harder with the new variant, and that's leading to these pressures on the NHS, which are really very serious. Well, let's indeed. talk, about, let's the talk about Let's talk about schools. Because oh, Gavin, I was going to talk about the ICU news. Well, well yes. I'm going to come to that, but I just want to talk about schools in particular, because many of our viewers are waking up this morning and have no idea whether their school is open, whether it should be open, whether it's safe or not safe. Do you believe it is safe for kids to go back to school, and not because of their own health, but because of the fact that we know that all kids at all ages are much faster receptors of this virus than adults? Well, the first point you make is critical, which is that uh, children are very, very unlikely to, uh, to have a disease uh, if they catch coronavirus and to be ill. And that's just really important to continue to reassure people. Uh, that is true for the new variant as well as for the old variant. Uh, and, you know, as a father myself, obviously that, you know, that matters. It's the number one question people ask about, uh, about, about, about this coronavirus. Um, the, the next point is about, um, the, about schools being open because we know that when schools are open, that can lead to an increase in the transmission. And hence, in the most uh, impacted areas where the pressures on the NHS are greatest, including London, but not just London, then we have said that schools should not open. And that is based on the public health advice. Of why course, does Gavin Williamson... Big, sorry, with respect, why does, Gavin, big, why does Gavin Williamson... We've now reached a point where every statement he makes, making any kind of promise, within three days, the complete opposite happens. And we saw it with primary schools this week. We need an education secretary who gives clarity, not more confusion. Well, he, there you are again, uh, having a go for pe us moving fast. You know, yes, we moved fast last week. No, he to... didn't move fast, though. He did the opposite. If he'd done what he finally ended up doing, which is what many people thought he should have done, that's one thing. He said he wasn't going to do it, and then he did it. He got bounced into a U-turn within two, three days. My point is, that doesn't instill confidence in people, particularly at the start of a new term, when people are anxious and worried and don't know what to do. They've got the education secretary saying one thing, and then immediately, within two, three days, doing the complete opposite. 
Well, a as the data changes, so we have to act. And this comes back to your previous question. You know, when, when the data changes, then we do act, absolutely. Uh, and that's what we've done with respect to schools. And it's so important to, to protect the NHS from the pressures that it's under, Let's which are very significant indeed. Let's talk about the pressures on the NHS. We spoke to an extremely experienced ICU nurse, Dave Carr. He said that it is currently worse in his hospital than the first wave. He says his nurses are overwhelmed and exhausted. They are understaffed. They are underpaid. We went into this crisis 40,000 nurses short. And he has a direct question for you, Health Secretary. Let's listen to Dave Carr. I would like you to ask him how, um, how we can seriously look any health worker in the face and, 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 and tell us that he is stewarding the NHS and managing this, this, this pandemic properly. Um, you know, we, we're doing this understaffed, we're doing this underpaid. I mean, the insult that we got early, earlier on in the year with no pay rise for what we've done in COVID really, really hurt us. Mr Hangot. Well, the... Um... The, the staff across the NHS have done an absolutely, absolutely brilliant job. There are huge pressures now in some parts of the country, uh, including in London. I'm very pleased that actually earlier in the year we were able to give a pay rise, a significant pay rise to all uh, NHS nurses, uh, including, uh, the well, right across the board. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a mission in the NHS, which is to care for people, and they're working, you know, everybody, all colleagues in the NHS are working incredibly hard on uh, to How do that. How are you going to fill the nursing shortage? I mean, yes. firstly, yes. So on the pay instance, rise, yes. uh, significant so, so the... is not the way that Dave Carr described that pay rise. But what about the numbers? You are so short of nurses, it is not surprising. Some of these nurses, he says, are experiencing PTSD. You're going to lose nurses rather than gain them right now, aren't you? Well, actually, no. On the contrary, uh, over the last year, we've seen an increase of 13,000 in the number of nurses that we've got in the NHS, including some retired nurses coming back, but largely that's new nurses into the NHS. And, you know, the fact that a vocation in healthcare and in the NHS is so rewarding has, in fact, you know, been, been reinforced. So I know a lot of people thought that we'd lose people from the NHS because of the pandemic and because of the pressures of work. Um, but actually, overall, there's been a very significant increase in the number of nurses in the NHS. You are still short. No, because the, that's not quite right, because that 40,000 figure uh, is, doesn't include uh, the number of people who actually fill uh, fill spaces that on a temporary basis. We want to make them permanent, but they are there. So uh, I don't want to go back into the, uh, the fact that we've got this commitment for 50,000 more nurses in our manifesto, but we're delivering on it. And okay. even through this pandemic, even in the most difficult year that the NHS has had, without doubt in its 70, over 70 year history, we've managed to increase the number of doctors and okay. increased by 13,000 the number of what nurses. What is going so on, Health Secretary, with the Nightingale hospitals? Because it's quite clear that most of them are not functioning at the moment, and it's also quite clear the reason for this you is that we do staff. not have the staff to operate any form of ICU in the Nightingale hospitals. Is that the situation? Uh, no. So the situation in the Nightingales is that they are on standby if they're needed. Over the summer, we built extra capacity inside the NHS hospitals. Um, and we took that approach in order to be as well prepared as we could be for this winter. And we've hired those extra people that, I've, uh, that I, I mentioned. Uh, so the, N the Nightingale hospitals are there if they're needed. But the best care you'll get is inside an NHS hospital. But so we're obviously just using to clarify, that first. Are the Nightingale hospitals able to provide intensive care for anybody? They're able to provide care for people who have COVID but don't have comorbidities. So not, in, not intensive care. So what happens when the intensive care units, as we're seeing in some hospitals, start to get full and can't take any more? Where are you going to treat people who need intensive care for COVID? Well, one of the advantages... It can't be the Nightingales, right? Uh, one of the advantages of having a national health service is that we're able to ensure that if, there's, if, the, if there isn't capacity where you are, 
then you will get treatment somewhere else. So you will have seen some of the stories about people being moved to get care to other parts of the country. And we do that in order to relieve the pressure on areas uh, where there is that pressure. But now, that's obviously... Nightingale hospitals. Sorry, but the but Nightingale, Nightingale hospitals are there uh, at, in order to provide that extra capacity if it's needed. And yes, we need those extra staff. Uh, and yes, people are working incredibly hard. Uh, uh, and if the Nightingales are needed, then we'll need people working very hard in the Nightingales as well. But they are there and they're ready uh, if they're needed as a backup. But all of this, in a way, back, it comes back to the original part of our discussion, which is that over the next few weeks, we all have to do our bit to control the virus and not to pass it on to minimise these pressures as much as possible I on the NHS. I think Health Secretary, we've knowing, got to end it there, but I think the knowing, best way to do our bit... Knowing way to that do the vaccine bit, is on its yeah, way Health Secretary, and that, the that vaccines is our are way here, through but this. In terms of doing our bit, you guys in government need to provide firm leadership and clarity. And it seems to me there is no logic left on the table that does not spell out loudly and clearly national lockdown immediately. Mm. Keir Starmer's right and you guys are dithering again. Please take decisive action. Lives will depend on it. Thank you for joining us this morning.